He was the man who made Nixon buckle, who went on to become a TV icon. And for the last seven years, Sir David Frost has been a central figure on Al Jazeera. Hello, welcome to Frost Over the World, a new program for a new station. Headline interviews making headline news. Benazir, hello and welcome. Celebrities lining up to be interviewed by him. So who will be playing me? It's a little Jew. A career that never failed to Quite dazzle. Cool. Why not acting? Sparkle and surprise. Could we tempt you to play us out with a bit of music? I think so, David. Oh, thank God. Praise the Lord. Sir David Frost arrived at Al Jazeera as one of the world's best-known interviewers. He made an immediate impact, not just with the viewers, but with us, the team here. His presence, his zest for life, were an inspiration to me and everyone. In addition to the untrue statements that you've mentioned... This was, um, after all, the man who took Richard Nixon to task in 1977, say, finally getting an apology for lying to the American people during the Watergate scandal. I'm sorry. I just hope I haven't left you, let you down. I had. I let down my friends. I let down... the country. I let the American people down. And I have to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life. My political life is over. His groundbreaking interviews with the former US president brought him to the world stage. And when he came to Al Jazeera in 2006, the top line interviews just kept coming. His first show featured an interview with the embattled British Prime Minister Tony Blair under fire over the war in Iraq. The number of uh, Iraqis who died uh, is between 100,000 and 150,000 and so on. With those scale of figures, if you had known that that was the scale of bloodshed, would you have still gone to war? Well, the alternative was leaving Saddam in charge of Iraq where hundreds of thousands of people died. There were a million casualties in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, Kuwait was invaded, um, and four million people went into exile. So far, it's been you know, pretty much of a disaster. It, it, it has, but you see, in the end, what we've got to understand, and this is why it's so important for us to send a message to the region, we are not walking away from Iraq. Tony Blair's big admission about a disaster in Iraq was the first of many headlines during David's time at Al Jazeera. It's a joy and a blessing that we're recording this so that, uh, so that we, we, we'll, yes, we'll come. In 2007, he spoke to Benazir Bhutto, planning her return to Pakistan after an assassination attempt. He wasn't to know it was to be her last international TV interview. Benazir, hello and welcome. Thank you, David. Tell me, has that terrible assassination attempt uh, affected your decision to carry on with this battle? No, it's uh, that uh, horrific incident in which uh, 158 innocent young men, a woman, a baby lost their lives has just made me do more determined to continue. I do believe Pakistan is under increasing threat of an extremist takeover. And to save the country, I believe we must restore democracy, get the people's faith in the country, moving the country forward. So I'm determined to go ahead with the mission to save Pakistan with democracy. This is the moment Benazir Bhutto was assassinated. She was killed in a gun and suicide bomb attack just outside the capital, Islamabad, while campaigning for re-election. President, it's so good, so good to see you again. So good to see you. And you, behind you, the flag and that beautiful, beautiful photograph of, uh, of Benazir. Yes. 
And she made the supreme sacrifice, didn't she? Yes, she did. She knew that, though. She knew that and she spoke about it all the time. You know that and I know that, that she had this um, thought in the back of her mind that they will assassinate me. You said, you said there was always that, there was a sadness in her eyes on occasion, yes? Yeah. You must miss her every day. Every moment, every second. 6-7 happened. Politicians and world leaders somehow found time to speak to him. They liked him. They liked his style. And you've got an eight-point lead this week. Uh, Politicians always say they don't really look at the polls, but I can re re reveal exclusively on this programme that, uh, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Journal du Dimanche had that headline, Financial Crisis France Threatened. Um, you don't look as though you're feeling threatened. You're quite right. <laughs> you read my mind and my, my, my face properly. I do not feel threatened. I feel very encouraged. I feel determined. Should it be, do you think, uh, former prime minister or would you prefer future prime minister? Well, how about both? <clears throat> OK. But they also knew his reputation as an interviewer who got to the heart of the matter. You asked that there would be no further attacks, obviously, on UN buildings, and you were given those assurances. Then two days later, another UN school was hit, and two young brothers died, and their mother lost her legs, mm. and so on. I mean, so in that case, the, the assurance was not carried out by his. I was uh, so much uh, frustrated and upset about what had happened. Uh, that's why I have asked, uh, protested, in the strongest possible terms and ask the full investigation into this issue. Amma, how does it uh, affect your future running for president by the fact that the Muslim Brotherhood has done rather well this week? I mean, is that good news for you or not? Uh, I must say that the democracy is democracy. We cannot opt for democracy and then lament uh, the, the, the results. David regularly presented landmark programs. In 2009, the former leaders of the East and West, Presidents Bush and Gorbachev, came together to mark the 20-year anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I have a very uh, clear memory, of course, of November the 9th, because I had the pleasure and the honour of spending it with you in the White House at a dinner for Cory Aquino. And that was on the very same day as it all happened, wasn't it? It was the exact same day. and happened faster and sooner than a lot of us thought it ever would. Yeah. And, yeah, it was quicker than... You'd predicted it would happen within... In an earlier interview, it would happen within your presidency, but it happened within eight weeks of your saying that. That's right, and, and it, it, it didn't... I would say that a lot of people were totally surprised. Uh, I can't say we saw it coming that fast, though. It was quick, 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 quick. How did you learn that the wall had started to fall that day? Who told you? Well, I learned about it the next morning. My international experts told me the ambassador had called, the Soviet ambassador had called. And so I learned um, the next morning. I, of course, was quite aware about what was happening in Germany, in the GDR. I knew that the Germans were all worked up. A great interviewer needs to ask great questions. For David Frost, the perfect question was always at hand. I hadn't realized fully until relatively recently, with you negotiating with, talking with the Taliban and so on, that the Taliban, in fact, uh, murdered your father. Uh, they, they did, yes. Uh, my father was murdered in... Uh, uh, 1999. Does that make it more difficult? Do you, when you meet the Taliban or representatives of the mm -hmm. Taliban, do you feel you forgive them for that or can you never forget it? Hundreds of thousands of Afghans have lost life. Yes. Uh, during the Taliban rule in Afghanistan and afterwards. And my father was uh, one Afghan uh, among the thousands of Afghans who lost their lives. Taliban on verge of collapse after surge success, allies insist. Now that, that's incredibly good news if true, um, but it, 
it goes further than you just did. And well, is well, this overstating it a bit? I would be more measured. In fact, I must confess that after seeing that headline uh, in the morning update that we have uh, each day, uh, I suggested that perhaps uh, we might want to avoid that kind of chest thumping, uh, that it might be a bit premature. Do you fear that uh, you will end up in an American jail? That's a problem. Uh, um, my lawyers certainly fear that. Prime Minister, how does it work out with um, uh, Kevin Rudd as uh, Foreign Secretary and so on, in the sense that obviously, famously, you ousted him as Prime Minister. Do you think he still has, it would be very human if he did, the hope of managing to reverse the situation and replace you again? How, do you, how, how intimate can you be in that situation? I think for Kevin, there is obviously a sense of sadness. You wouldn't be uh, human if you weren't hurt by the events of last year and by uh, losing the Prime Ministership. People will say in the years to come that uh, you and Kevin lived happily ever after. I would hope so. The former Australian Prime Minister sworn in as leader once more. But behind the smiles, the truth is Australian politics is brutal. Kevin Rudd toppled Julia Gillard in a Labor leadership vote on Wednesday, largely seen as a move to avenge what happened three years ago when Gillard ousted Rudd. David respected privacy, mostly. You'd like to marry again, probably? <laughs> but I'm still married. You are? Yes. Yes, with oh. the same man, with Roberto. <laughs> so uh, uh, we are separate. No, yeah. I, this is true. We are, we are separate from, from uh, one year and a half. But we are in good relation. We are, we are in, 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 you know, in harmony. At least uh, we, we really understand that such a, it's absolutely difficult for um, uh, opera singers to, uh, as at this level to, to be all the time together. He wants me to sing all the time with him. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand yeah. why he would want that. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> no guest was more important than any other, and David was always at pains to put everyone at ease, off camera and on, an approach that coaxed many into revealing extraordinary okay, insights. David, we are recording, so in your own time. James Lovelock there, talking to me earlier. My next guest has a truly remarkable story. Born in war-torn Sudan, Emmanuel Jal was forced to become a child soldier at the age of seven or eight. Emmanuel, welcome. Oh, thank you. How did you escape after five years from war? We had to, we had to go to a place called what? And so the journey was supposed to be one month but it took us three months because on the way there was uh, starvation. A lot of people died on the way and there was cannibalism. And in the process, I was, I was even tempted to eat one of my friends. And you were tempted to eat one of your friends? Yes. He'd just died, had he? Because what happened early on, there was, there was no food. So we're depending on vultures, snails, some were eating snakes and frogs. Those were our meals. And then when a dead body dies, so we'll use those dead bodies to trap these animals or scavengers to come and we shoot them. And after a while, those animals kept off. And when they kept off, so one of the magicians that was with us started eating dead bodies. And for me, my friend was dying that night, and I look at him and I tell him, I'm going to eat you tomorrow. As time went by, what was the worst thing, thinking that this ordeal might never end, that, that you might be in captivity for years and years, or the fear of death, that they would kill you? You see, what happens is that perhaps in the first years of captivity, uh, being alive is like your obsession. You mm. want to be alive. Mm. But then, because your life lingers in this kind of very um, dark, you know, gloomy life, you, you begin to think that there are things more important than living. And, and, and especially for me, what was really important was not to lose what I thought I had to preserve. And at first, I, I didn't know how to express 
that's what I had to preserve. But it, it, it could be a sense of dignity, a sense mm -hmm. of respect, something that I knew I, I, that was threatened because of the way they were, they were treating us. But you said, my body is... His love of sport never left him, and he always enjoyed interviews with sports stars. Even the notoriously private Andy Murray opened up to him about life on the circuit. It's been about seven years we've been together, and I, I, I met her for the first time at the US Open in 2006, I think it was, so it's been, been a long time. Seven years? Yeah, seven years. You're not secretly married, are you? No, <laughs> not yet. No, no matter how much she's pushing me. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, uh, haven't fallen for it yet. Andy Murray's tweet after that interview? Legend. Your dad, who was a mentor, and um, introduced you to Jesse Owen? What people don't realize is that Jesse had this amazing thing with Hitler and won these gold medals for the Olympics. But he was shortly thereafter banned. Um, he lost his amateur status. And he also went to his, his ticker tape parade party in the service elevator. I mean, he was not allowed to go up the regular because of he was a black man there. So therefore, he was treated better at the Olympic Games you know, in, in Hitler's time than he was when he came back home. So it was really an interesting yeah, thing. Yeah, Sammy Davis, too, couldn't stay in Miami in the same hotel where he was performing. Right, right. Run, it, it, just it's, it's, it's just a, it's, amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing thing that we don't think about. And so years later, when I was at the Olympics, I remember I was at the Games, and, and one of the guys finished it. Some reporter said, yeah, you know, you might have got the four gold medals, but you'll never be Jesse Owens. And I said, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm going up the front elevator. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. In 2008, the film Frost Nixon came out, the big screen version of David's epic interviews with Richard Nixon. I'll have um, a cheeseburger. Mm, that sounds good. I used to love cheeseburgers. So was I more difficult or less <laughs> difficult than Tony Blair? Well, you're, uh, I mean, it's fascinating you saying about you know, watching all the interviews. And it's, it's because, of course, there's so much footage of you. And that makes things in some ways easier because I'm able to watch you know, a lot of that was the week that was and the Frost Report and, and, and all the way through the TV AM days and, and everything else. But, uh, and so for me, what I wanted to do was go back to everything that came before the Frost Nixon interview. There's uh, a piece, I don't know if you've read it, but by Andrew Marr yeah. uh, called In Praise of Cheeky Young Men, which is all about you. Yeah. And uh, it's that, that, that cheeky young man that you were was, uh, was fantastic to just you know, spend time with well, when you do, doing the you research. Do I'm not probably the person to judge, but, the, <laughs> but I think you do it, do it brilliantly. And the, the two of you to, together with Frank Langella are an in, incredible team. It's a funny thing that I've never been uh, challenged to a duel before. <laughs> I guess that's what this is. Yeah, well, not really. Of course it is. And I like that. No holds barred, eh? What was it that really uh, appealed to you about this project? Where was it when you thought it? Well, in fact, uh, well, this is bizarre. Here, uh, yeah. <laughs> First of all, I've always wanted to be interviewed by you. Uh, I, I pined for it for years. I had to make a movie about you in order to finally get on one of your programs. But this is, so this is fantastic. We've been waiting. <laughs> Celebrities queued up to be interviewed by David Frost. It was sometimes hard to tell who was most thrilled to be sitting opposite whom. I once asked an old Howard this question, which is, what is star quality? And he said, the stars have it, and the non-stars don't. <laughs> that was, that was his, his definition of something. But what is, what is star quality, do you think? Um, uh, the ability to say you had once asked Noel Coward a question <laughs> makes you a star. Uh, that's a pretty great one. Um, <laughs> I'm impressed by that. You don't think in terms of decades when you were an actor. You think, in t all you think in terms of those nominations, the ones you didn't get it. I got, I got, I got two out of seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An average of 28 percent, roughly. Yeah, and, you, and, and roughly the other, equivalent yeah, to the, the Labour vote. Yeah, the other five times you have to sit there with that face. You know, when, oh, the other, when you uh, do that clapping, you go, yeah, oh, oh, what a oh so, well, yeah, so, so, <laughs> so, so, so sincere. The most hypocritical it, face you ever pulled. Yeah. Dustin Hoffman said to me that he'd always wanted to play Hitler, for instance. Wow. 
Uh, which so would be, be a great subtext. Yes, yes. Definitely, definitely going to do it. What are you doing now? Definitely going, <laughs> going to conquer Poland. Conquer Poland. <laughs> <laughs> That's like pretty wonderful. <laughs> so who will be playing me? The little Jew. Oh, wonderful. I think I've always wanted to play Einstein, I guess, but mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah. That's kind of coming at the idea of just to see, knowing about him, knowing you know his history. I'd be like, that'd be something really wonderful. Yeah, that would. That would in be a musical. In a musical. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What would it be? Sitting, called? traveling at the speed of life. No, I don't know. <laughs> this is our first, our first interview for. 35 years. Oh, God, David, when you just said, you know, actress for 40 years, that I, was a I, nasty I, moment yes, for me. Yes, I, I sensed a, a slight <laughs> a, a frisson. frisson <laughs> yes. Did you have to say that? Oh, well. <laughs> but it was, um, here's, here's what the, what, it was Cosmopolitan magazine, and here's what, this was the uh, article that resulted. <laughs> Helen Mirren, courtesan of Tomorrow, revolutionary of today, and actress extraordinary, excuse me, and that, uh, and you, look at youth, you. youthful lad there, yes. but look, even nicer to look at, however, is this picture accompanied it of you. Oh, yes, uh, very sexy. Very good stuff, yes. very good stuff. Very sultry. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and you came into the, the suite at the Hotel Lancaster, and you said, and I quote here, do you mind if I use your bath? The place where I'm staying doesn't have one, and I haven't had a bath in ages. That was a unique start to an interview. Yeah. How disgusting. You, probably, I'm sure it was true. I, I wouldn't, was never staying in anywhere with baths in those days. Would you, would you send, send someone, would you be tempted to do a James Bond film? It would be rather different, James Bond. Well, I, well you're, you're touching on a sore point, because actually I wanted to do Casino Royale, not the movie they made, but, um, but years ago, I read the book and I go, well, this should be done. This really hasn't been done. And I'm the reason they made the damn thing. Right. Because I started saying that I wanted to do it and stuff. And then, and they were, the Broccoli's uh, opinion was, oh, it's unmakeable. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, on all the websites, everybody was saying, what do you want from a James Bond? I want to see Tarantino do Casino Royale. So that all got them to do it. But look, I understand the situation. I'm not going to trust them enough to give them final cut, and they're not going to trust me enough <laughs> to give me final cut. All right, you know, so I kind of get it. In 2012, the Frost interview took David back to where it all began. Longer interviews with people who would help to change the world. He traveled far and wide, but always took with him those questions that had to be asked. Can you remember the night before you went? Were you able to sleep or unable not, to sleep? Not very Too well. Too excited or what? Well, I'd been into space once before. <clears throat> and uh, fighter pilots not supposed to have fear. Right. Okay? It's a paralyzing emotion. You, it alters your ability to look at what you're doing right now uh, with, with great clarity. So I, I guess we uh, fulfill the description of having ice in our veins. You've never really blamed Yoko for the breakup, as a lot no, of people no, no. did, have you? No, I think, you know, at the beginning it was difficult because she was sit in on sessions. And you'd have to try and get your mind around this. You have to think, well, wait a minute. John's in love with this woman. This is not an ordinary relationship. She's not an ordinary woman. You've got to admit that. But I, she certainly didn't break the group up. The group was breaking up. The final word goes to the two men who changed the East-West politics of the world, talking to the man who changed the world of television. On that day, David Frost was the only man they would both talk to. I don't do stuff anymore. I don't do interviews. Very, 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 very rare interview. And uh, I, I much prefer to just be back in Houston or in Maine. and and. Letting, letting historians decide what we got right and what we may have screwed up. The man who changed the world. That's a great legacy to have, isn't it? I always thought that history was a very fickle lady. No, history will be faithful in your case. Oh. Thank you so much for doing this and finding the time to do this. As ever, it's a privilege. When you feel you need to talk, let me assure you that I'll always make time, I'll always find the minutes in order to talk.